from the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hey everybody, once again, you are listening to Talking Catholic. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pete Sanchez, staff writer, social media coordinator for the Catholic Star Herald newspaper. And I'm here with Mike Walsh, Director of Communications. How are you, Mike? I'm well. I'm fighting a head cold, and a lovely Sorry spring head cold, but so I'll sound a little raspy today. It's 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 spring, but it sounds very much, <clears throat> I mean, outside the weather seems very much late July-ish with all the storms we've got. Yeah, it's it's been insane. Uh, this is, this is going to soon be day three of massive uh, thunderstorms coming through, which ordinarily mm-hmm. I love, except that there's a ton of stuff going on in the diocese this week, and I'm bouncing around all over the place. I don't enjoy driving through massive thunderstorms. Mm-hmm. I definitely felt mass history at the Ascension at Holy Eucharist. I felt almost like the descent of Pentecost. You could hear the wind blowing outside in the rain. It's like, is something going to happen here? But... I mean, but you were, you were fine. Nobody nobody rose to heaven or anything like that. No, but it was okay. still extraordinary. I mean, the mass is always extraordinary. Well, of course. So it was. Uh, it, you went to a Latin mass? Okay. No, no, oh, no that would I did. You know, I was just mass. thinking. I was thinking about that. No, I went to uh, Holy Eucharist, which is the, uh, the I don't want to say the ordinary form of the mass. That sounds demeaning. Yeah, that's, still a beautiful mass. It's it, exactly what it is. It's the ordinary. It is. It is. Um, so I guess. Canonically or liturgically, I could have said ordinary, but right. I didn't feel right. Okay, I hear you. And uh, but joining us uh, once again is Mary Beth Peabody, communications and marketing manager for the Office of Catholic Schools. How are you, Mary Beth? I'm doing great, Pete. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank Good. you so much for joining us. Uh, we feel blessed twice in two weeks. This is wonderful. This is lovely. I'll tell you what. A little, little different subject today than hanging out at the Jersey Shore, but I yes. uh, hope everyone enjoyed whatever they did last weekend down there for Memorial Day. Yeah, I stuck around here. I was local, but I'll be down there soon. And speaking of the shore, in the diocese, in the counties, Atlantic County, Cape May County, shore masses are are abundant now. They uh, For all the, all the shoobies, I guess, that are coming down that we talked about. Or now the, remember, shoobies are day trippers. Day trippers? Mm-hmm. Well, well, if you do go on a Sunday, mm-hmm. they can do a day trip on a Sunday. Sure. So. And definitely you want to start out your short trip by going to Mass first thing in the morning and then, then going to the beach. Yes. Yes. <laughs> better words, Mike. I don't think you've said better words on this podcast. I was actually being facetious, but okay. There you go. No, I think that sounds wonderful. A good way to start your day off with Mass. You can find the summer Mass schedule on the org and the org. Uh, they have daily masses and also when uh, there's time for confession and also holy days and, and adoration and also Sunday masses. So join Mike at, you go to, what church do you go what, what Well, church? I never get to go to the shore anymore, so uh, I don't know. When I do, it's usually St. <laughs> Damien Parish in Ocean City or Our Lady Star of the Sea in Cape May. Yeah, I'd like St. Nick. Still thinking, I still believe the most beautiful church in the diocese. Our Lady Star of the Sea. And came out, yeah. That was a beautiful moment last year for the art in the schools. Yeah, that was with nice. Mary Beth. I come to think of it, yeah, another Mary Beth uh, oriented podcast. Yeah. Good times. So then, yeah, check that out for the summer mass schedule all summer long. Then coming up this Saturday, June 1st, join the Marian Ministry of the Catholic Community of the Holy Spirit in Mullica Hill for a day long workshop on Mary. It will be called The Villages of Mary, and the guest speaker will be Joan Sandell of Christ Our Light Parish in Cherry Hill. This event will be from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. and will end with Mass. So there's no cost, but bring a picnic lunch for yourself. Uh, everyone ages 12 and up is welcome. And uh, Catholic, the Catholic Community of the Holy Spirit Parish Center is at 17 Erlington, 17 Erlington Avenue in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. And anybody interested, email Lorraine Hanasco. At Lorraine dot or Lorraine Hanasco, that's H N O S K O at yahoo.com, or call her at 856 981 1232. Yeah. That and you know, true. people could prepare for it by listening to our Mary podcast uh, from a few weeks ago with Father yeah. Tim Byerly. Yes. And, and Kim, Kim Posotsky, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, illuminative. I, wow, I nice 10 cent word. Good job. I, well, I learned from the best, Mike. Hey, you know man, that. I appreciate it. The uh, yeah, no, no, no. That's 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 really good. I hope people will go to it. I, I will warn though, uh, anyone going to that uh, church, uh, double check your GPS directions because depending on the GPS you use, like I often use Waze, 
which tries to drive me through a barrier wall to get in there because they reoriented that sec- where that part of Mullica Hill where that's located, and the 322 bypass goes through. And I don't think they've exactly updated their maps, so getting to that uh, that church can be a little tricky. So just you know, if you haven't been there before, open up Google Maps and familiarize yourself with Mullica Hill, downtown Mullica Hill. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you don't want to end up in the Mullica River, I guess, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I, no, you don't. Though that's quite far away from Mullica Hill. Oh, really? Yeah, Mullica Hill, uh, Mullica River is down by Hamilton, and Mullica Hill is up in the you know beautiful farm adjacent to the beautiful farmlands of Gloucester County. Okay, do not. I'm I'm better. This is why I did all the spelling bees. I was never in the geography bees. I hear you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> that's good. So even if you get lost, you will not end up at the river. That's good. That's right. yeah. <laughs> but. Check it out, June 1st in Mullica Hill, Catholic Community of the Holy Spirit. And then June 9th, this is going to be next weekend. There will be a Mass for Anointing of the Sick at Our Lady Guadalupe Parish and Shrine at St. Lawrence Church, 135 North Whitehorse Pike. This is starting at 2.30 p.m. on Sunday, June 9th. This is going to be, a, there's a free will offering, and there will be a fellowship after Mass again. Uh, all are loved, all are welcome for this, for a mass for the anointing of the sick, for healing and for the healing of your loved ones. Uh, then if you want to call uh, for more information, call the parish office at 856-627-2222. Again, mass for anointing the sick at St. Lawrence Church on the Whitehorse Pike, 2.30 p.m. Sunday, June 9th. And then, Mike, we've talked about this before. And Mary Beth, are you a, uh, are you, are you two into soccer? Are you ready for the Women's World Cup? Uh, I mean, I always, that's really the only soccer I appreciate is Olympic and World Cup soccer. I'm not a big soccer person otherwise. Okay. I really loved being a soccer mom many years ago, but, you know, aside from the snacks and all that, I that was kind of the extent of it. It's fine, but I'd have to, I would be lying to say I follow it closely. But we do enjoy watching young people play it. Is, that, is there an opportunity for that coming up? It Pete? is fun. There, it, actually, Mike, it's funny you say that. There is. The, the Diocese of Camden is going to host our first ever soccer cup. This sounds awesome. This is going to be Saturday, June 15th from 8.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. at St. Augustine Prep School, 611 Cedar Avenue in Richland. So lace up your cleats and get on your shin guards, uh, anyone between the ages of 18 and 39. They will be divided into all boys and all girls squads. This is sponsored by the Diocesan Offices of the Hispanic Ministry and Youth, Young Adult, and Campus Ministries. And I hope there are orange slices, you know? Well, it wouldn't be a youth soccer game without orange slices. No, that is what I remember. I was uh, I was goalie um, for my intramural Catholic school team. And I just, that was the best part at the end. You know, after a hard game like that, after, you know, just throwing myself into whatever came my way, um, orange slices. I was a goalie. I had to protect. I hear you. I, I thought a, I was you, a wall. When you said that sentence, it, it occurred to me that maybe you were saying you needed to throw yourself into the orange slices, which <laughs> I appreciate. Sounds, I mean, that's that's dedication. Know, that sounds like a dream, Mike. Now I'm picturing just a big orange slice bowl and diving in. All right. I'm, I feel like we're learning too much about you again. That'd be vitamin C overload. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It might not be good. I don't know. Vitamin C is good, especially for you. You might you might actually need an orange juice bowl right now. Mike. Oh, well, I've been I've been I'm loaded up on vitamins right now. <laughs> I have this vitamin <laughs> so, drink that my wife uh, has me drink anytime okay. any of us start getting uh, ill. Well, everybody, feel free to send Mike orange slices <laughs> at the uh, sure. communications office here, and feel better, Mike. Really, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hope hopefully you feel better for the soccer cup again Saturday, June fifteenth. 8.30 to until 5 at St. Augustine Prep. The event is free. For more information, contact Jose Rodriguez, jose.rodriguez at canadiasis.org, or 856-CALL HIM, 856-583-6172. And then we've, uh, last year, Mike, I think one of the best podcasts we did was in August when we talked to students uh, who went on Summer in the City. Yeah, that was a blast. That was really fun. Those yeah. kids were great. Yeah, we talked to about almost 15, 16 of them, almost 20. We talked to a lot of them. I don't think there was quite that many, but yeah, it was a lot. It was. It we, was we had, I think there were like six on the podcast. I don't, anyway, well, it, it was a good group of kids, a gr- hey, good group of If people want to find out, they can go back and listen to the old podcast, August yes. of last year. Go, good f- job. F- You're promoting old episodes. Let, let, us, let us know which one was right. Yes. Um... 
so the Summer in the City program, listen to that, but basically it's a, it's a service learning week for high school students, teens in grades 9 to 12. This will take place from Sunday, August 11th to Saturday, August 17th. And this year, this, uh, every week, the focus, it's focused on four pillars of service, social justice, community, and spirituality. Um, students, teens will learn about Catholic social teaching. There'll be activities. There'll be community service. There'll be group discussions about uh, um, stuff like poverty, uh, solidarity, and the dignity of the human person. It's going to be, again, Sunday, August 11th to Saturday, August 17th at the Kairos ret- Retreat Center next to Holy Spirit High School in Absecon. Registration is on a first-come, first-served basis, and it's $160. It includes room, board, program tuition, and transportation to and from work sites. And there are also scholarships available for anybody uh, who wants to go, but uh, it's kind of a hardship for them to pay the $160. So questions, call the uh, Office of Youth Ministries at 856-583-2908 for more information. So that's it. Those are and Mike and Mary Beth. We uh, we had some unfortunate news come across uh, our desks, our you know our phones this past weekend with the passing of uh, Bishop Joseph Galante, the uh, seventh Bishop of Camden. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, I mean, he had been. We know he had been ill for for quite some time. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons he retired early was um, was be, was due to health reasons. Um, and uh yeah it was uh it, it was i wouldn't say it was unexpected but you know you never know when that's going to happen and and it did and uh you know we're we're happy that he's gone back to the lord but i, I think if there was one thing you know i, I posted the news on the uh, social media sites uh this weekend and you know I certainly knew he was beloved, um, but I was truly impressed by the range of people who commented on the post. Um, he he was a people don't know he was a bishop in three dioceses in Texas as well, and uh, those dioceses had shared the post as well. And um, a lot of people from Beaumont, Texas, and Dallas, Texas, and San Antonio, Texas, were all commenting on his uh, his passing as well, and just how beloved he was. And you know he was. Yeah, it was explained to me. He was very much a people person. Um, far more, I, I probably would have had a difficult time with him because I'm not a people person, and that would have been difficult for me. But, um, but you know, my mother in law uh, worked in the school's office for for several years, and um, you know, she always spoke so lovingly of him, uh, Pat Money, and that is, and um, just just how much you know he sort of touched her life and how what a kind influence he was on her so actually as we why don't we introduce our guest a little early so that we can we can talk about bishop galante a little bit sure. we have uh mary boyle superintendent of schools mary how are you i'm doing well today thanks pete thank you so much for joining us good to be here oh it's uh Beautiful day, and, and with you is Bill Watson, Director of Curriculum Assessment. But for the uh, Mike, you and I are outnumbered. We have three Catholic schools people, and you and I are the communications. Uh, don't forget, I was a teacher at a, at a Catholic high school, so you're outnumbered four to one. Uh oh. Well, I'm part. I did teach nope, religious ed. Nope. No. Oh man. You're out. Oh man. Well, Bill, how are you? I'm great, Pete. Great to be back. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. And so. Uh, Mary, you worked uh, you worked with Bishop Galante as I did. Uh, what, what do you remember about him? I worked with Bishop Galante, as you know, Pete, f- since I came to the office in 2004. But I've known Bishop Galante for a lot longer than that. I first met Father Galante in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia uh, in 1973. Shortly after that, when I was beginning my first teaching assignment... Bishop Galante's Aunt Rose Kachi was my great partner. So I got wow. to know Bishop Galante quite well by Aunt Rose, who was one of those more rigorous Catholic school teachers that frequently called people bold, brazen articles. And she would give that business to Bishop Galante as well. <laughs> so I got to know Bishop Galante quite well then and his mother and father. I had the privilege of Bishop Galante as Father Galante celebrating my grandfather's funeral mass, and then as Bishop Galante celebrating my father's funeral mass. So 
Uh, one of the great gifts of Bishop Galante, I think, was his ability to connect with the individual person. And that's what I've been hearing, Mike, about Bishop's death, is the, is the, the connection he made with individual people. Yeah, I, I agree completely. You know, he was the kind of person that, you know, looked in the eyes, really invested in you. He, in some ways, and I don't mean this to be disparaging, um, he really came across as someone who appreciates news and, and politics. He came across to me as a, a world class politician, you know, like someone out of the, the Bill Clinton mold of, you know, always knowing your name, always looking in your eye, always shaking your hand, always being very present when he was having a conversation with you. So the people that I've known who have worked with him and even in passing have just been speaking glowingly of him. Unfortunately, I really had no connection to him at all. I met him once at a parish in Glassboro uh, as one of the, unfortunately, one of the hallmarks of his, of his time in the diocese is he will always remember it as, as the bishop who brought in the merger process, which at that time was revolutionary. It had really never happened on such a large scale before. Since then, what we found was um, he was in fact revolutionary in the sense that so many other dioceses have had to do the same thing. And quite frankly, learn from the successes and mistakes that the Diocese of Camden made at that time. Um, Trenton, just going through this now, when it happened in Camden, it was every newspaper for weeks and months and years on end. Uh, Trenton did, is doing the same thing, and I think I've seen it written about maybe three or four times, because it's now so commonplace. But, I, you know, that was that was a Hercu Hercu Herculean task. And, I, I mean, some of the schools were merged as well during that, right? They were. We had begun some of the school me mergers uh, a year previous to the merging process for parishes. So, Yeah, that would have been not fun times. I remember I often have talked to my uh, – about my predecessor, uh, Andy Walton. And for all the difficult things that come with this job, he has remarked numerous times that the merger process was definitely the hardest part of, of his time, just because it was it's so heartbreaking to have to go through it. But it's, I mean, it's a hallmark of, of what happened during his, his uh, Bishop Galante's time in the diocese, but I, I don't think it should be the one thing he's remembered for. I think, if anything, he should be remembered for being a, a really personable person and a good a good father, a good shepherd. I mean, Pete, I mean, what were your interactions with him like? Well, Bishop Galante, I, when he was here, I remember I talked to, remember him from the press conferences. This was when he was active, the press conferences and the retreats that he led, which were always wonderful. The Linton and Advent retreats every year for employees, the Days of Reflection. Uh, and I saw that too, what, what Mary was saying, the, the people's uh, bishop. He, he was really uh, just down to earth. And I had the I had the true pleasure uh, 15 months ago or so to watch the uh, Eagles Super Bowl win 52 against the Patriots with him at his private re residence, and he invited me to come down and I watched the game with him. And he was an Eagles super fan. I could tell uh, he had his Son Jackson number 10 jersey on, and just watching the game with him was such a joy because it's that. The, if it seems like Philadelphia sports fans, there are a few other fans in the country that have this, but they have that hope. And that's such a the ever-Christian virtue of hope that, you know, you hope that the team, your team is going to go far. And that hope was realized that day when the Eagles won that Super Bowl. And it just awesome to watch it with him. You know, that's a wonderful moment, Pete, but I, I like how you just referred to uh, Philadelphia fans as ever-Christian that's, I don't think that makes it into the news very often <laughs> by referring to us as ever Christian. Well, as as a group that's often you know throwing snowballs at Santa and you know batteries I mean, at you know, Cowboys the fan. I'm notwithstanding the Boo Birds yeah. and hey, careful! I'm one of those people. Well, not not for Bryce Harper. Hopefully, he had a home run last night. He did. He was talking, but I think you're you know I, I I think that idea of hope is in us. We always. We always want, you know, despite our protestations, there's always that hope in us that something's going to happen. There's going to be that base hit, that touchdown, that three-point shot, that overtime goal. There's always going to be that. And it was just, it just bloomed that day, February 2nd, 2018. See, I think I disagree with you. I think that was the antithesis of what Philadelphia fans are. What Philadelphia fans are are the Joe Carter home run. 
uh, the 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 19, 1964 uh, fall of the Phillies, you know, things like that. I think more of as uh, you know the the two thousand four Super Bowl uh, not being able to make it into the end zone at the very end. You and I have two very different opinions of uh, uh, Philadelphia sports fans. Well, I, I, you you have so much more hope and desire. No, I mean I think I understand they have that what you're talking about. They remember that, but deep rooted in that is hope that maybe they have to they they don't know they have to nurture that hope that seed of hope come on philly fans see this is the difference you're just young enough that you've actually lived with championships in your life and so you think this this stuff kind of happens whereas i'm just old enough to remember how how terrible it was for decades the first championship was 2008 for me 93 was crushing yeah, yeah, 93 yeah. was crushing Joe Carter. And then again, it happened with the Raptors. Kawhi Leonard was a new Joe Carter. So anyway, Mike, who, let's... Um, well, hold on. But I, it is <laughs> it is an excellent... Just to go back to Bishop Galante for a second. That was one of the things that I, I was so thrilled that we, we did have the opportunity to do. And I'm really happy. I don't know if it was your idea or Carl's idea. Uh, Carl uh, Peters, the managing editor of the Catholic Star Herald, to actually sit with uh, Bishop Calante during that game because there was no guarantee that the Eagles were going to win that game. Um, mm-hmm. So it could that story could have gone in a completely different fashion. But knowing that he, someone who was such a huge uh, Philadelphia sports fan, in particular an Eagles fan, got to have that experience, you know, at that time, not knowing his end of days were coming, but but yeah. got to live through that before he died. I think that was outstanding. I was very happy. For I would Bishop not be Joe. shocked if that's mentioned during his uh, his funeral. As a matter of fact. No, yeah. I, th- I I would hope it would be. And just one last thing. Serendipitous. F- Super Bowl 52, 5 plus 2, 7, which is a holy number. And also, he was 7th Bishop of Camden. Yep. That's uh, that's proving you can do anything with numbers, Pete. I Good think, job. Well, well I, I don't know. There, I think just think there's got to be something to that. But well, let's uh, let's, let's let's go back to our, our let's our, go back to our guests for a little bit. Yes, Mary. So uh, just speak a bit. You you, you mentioned uh, before that you uh, you started. You were superintendent when two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. And I came were, to yes, I came into the superintendency in 2008. And before that, you were previous working. to that. I was assistant superintendent for a little bit of time in there. I was acting superintendent because Sister Dawn Gear was going through some medical issues. So, but you had a long and distinguished teaching career and administration career before you came to the Diocese of Camden. Can you tell us I a little bit about that? I certainly did, and, and uh, Bishop Galante's Aunt Rose Kachi taught me the best where I go. began <laughs> teaching in Levittown, Pennsylvania. So I, I've been teaching since 1973 in some capacity because even my work now as superintendent, I can, can still consider a teaching role. So I taught primary grades, middle school grades, and high school biology before moving into leadership in Catholic education as a principal and assistant superintendent and superintendent. And since we live on the same side of the river and I sent my children to Catholic school very close to where you taught, and we know so many of the same people, it is amazing that our paths did not cross it, sooner. It is true, but but an ironic way in which we, we met. Are you going to talk about that, Mary Beth? Do you want me to tell sure, that Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a unique story. It is a unique story. So um, as many of you will recall, the Pope came to Philadelphia a few years back. It was quite a big deal. And my husband and one of my sons and I had tickets to that large mass on the parkway. And we got down to the parkway and just got in and there was this sea of humanity of about a million people and we picked our little spot to stand for hours and hours and we started talking to these nice people next to us and we were there for three four hours because we had to wait we celebrated mass and fast forward a few months later I have finished a graduate program and I'm making a move from the corporate world through school, now looking for something in the nonprofit world, and I hear of a job opening for communications and marketing at the Diocese of Camden. So I'm putting together my cover letter, and I'm thinking, there's just something about this that's really ringing a bell, and it hit me, and I said to my husband, Eric, 
those people we poped with, I think, I think she was the superintendent of schools for the Diocese of Camden. And so I looked her up on LinkedIn, and there she was. And so I sent her a note, sent you a note, Mary. I feel like this is a uh, StoryCorps time, yeah. if anybody is familiar with NPR StoryCorps. Um, anyway, I sent Mary a note, and the rest was history. So uh, it was it was definitely meant to be. Absolutely. And a chance encounter, and we are benefiting by that chance encounter, which I believe is God's work. That's been the story of my life is where is God leading? And sometimes the path God leads is not exactly where you think God is going to lead. And so I think God led Mary Beth to us by a chance encounter on the Ben Franklin Parkway in the Philadelphia when Pope Francis was here. Well, it was a uh, it was definitely a special encounter. And for me, um, the experience of being here largely because of you, Mary, has has just shaped my life in a way that I would have never expected. This was a path that I never thought I would go down. I don't have a background in education, but what I have learned in the last three years and just watching you and the way that uh, nobody would believe the things that happen day in and day out and the times that you pick up and go, you go to a school, you're there on the phone, you, you're you thoughtful and uh, just just Every issue that comes up, I feel like, is approached with real care, and the, the people in the in the Diocese of Camden are really lucky to have had you here as their superintendent of schools, because I know how much you care. Which, I, since I, we just talked a little bit in the past tense, and we didn't actually mention it on the show yet, um, Mary has actually just announced her retirement uh, from, from the job after 17 years in the diocese, all, to, all told, I think. No, no. 15, 15 in the years diocese, in the, my yes. math skills are terrible that's right um and with the good news that uh bill watson our former guest on the podcast and someone you've actually heard me from time to time bring in to read ad spots for us because he's got such uh, the dulcet tones of, of bill watson uh dr bill watson's about to be our new superintendent in mere days so congratulations thanks mike it's yeah. um I, i'd like to echo what uh, mary beth said about about mary you know and i think being um you know, Mary's talked about, you know, the hand of God in these in these uh, communications. It's so often, in my view, Mary has been the instrument of God in those in those uh, interactions. It did not surprise me. I didn't know that you taught um, you had such a personal connection to uh, Bishop Galante. Um, but I, it doesn't surprise me or the story about uh, you're meeting Mary Beth. It doesn't surprise me. I think one of the things that I've learned over the last six years, I mean, <clears throat> I've worked, uh, excuse me, over the last six years with Mary. Uh, you know the Kevin Bacon game, you know, Six Degrees of... With Mary, it's two. Uh, <laughs> and so if you are listening to this podcast, there you are two degrees of separation from Mary Boyle. I mean, that I am fully confident of that. And there's probably a better than 50-50 chance that you're related to her somehow. <laughs> because the number of... of um, People that we've found out are uh, related to Mary uh, and, and that Mary knows uh, is, is incredible. And I think that just speaks to her also being a people person and using her gifts to bring people together um, and, and to be present to them. And one of the things that I've, I've learned quite a bit about um, that has very much influenced my work so far and I hope uh, far into the future is what Mary refers to as the ministry of presence, um, which is particularly today as we become... Uh, the temptation to disconnect, to be being disconnected, uh, to uh, sort of I don't want to say hiding behind an email, uh, but only communicating via any, you know the words that are typed on the page or a voice that comes over a phone. Um, you know, Mary, I think has taught us all that that ministry of presence, actually being there, is so so important, and and I think particularly so in Catholic schools, um, and, and I've I've learned that along with so so many other things. Um, but I think that's you know, one of the great gifts that uh, Mary has brought to the diocese uh, and, and to our office and to our schools that, um, uh, that I think we've all learned and, and hope to continue into the future. Bill, it's funny that you said that about people being related to Mary, because I'm pretty sure that Mary and I are related somehow. We haven't figured it out yet, but we, you know, we've got the whole Donegal connection and it's, it's got to be there. Um, so, Mary, I wanted to ask you, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Because you just, your your demeanor and your disposition, no matter how crazy the circumstances might be, you just manage it. And I'd love to know 
what what has been your biggest challenge as superintendent? I think the biggest challenge, Mary Beth, is the is the ability to be present that Bill just mentioned. You know, we have 28 elementary schools in the diocese. We have six high schools in the diocese and three private schools. We have a lot of activity at all of those schools. We have a lot of wonderful activities at at those schools. And being able to be present to so many schools and so many individuals is a challenge. And because of my personality, I, I want to be at many of those places for most of their high experiences. And I beat myself up a little bit when I can't be as present as I would want myself to be. You know, it's I, I jokingly, uh, I don't, actually not so jokingly, I, I tell people flat out that there are a few jobs in the diocese I never want. I don't want the bishop's job, and I don't want the superintendent of the school's job. Because I, I can't believe all the places you go to. How many schools in the diocese? 28 elementary schools and nine high schools, including the private schools. That's an insane amount of travel. To, and, you, and you being a very present person, I mean, you and I will be having a conversation about any number of topics. And the next thing I'll hear is, I'm on my way to, I have to leave early because I have to get to, and it's never home or the beach. It's always <laughs> a board meeting or some crisis of varying degree somewhere, or you're doing, uh, you're doing learning opportunities. Bill, I, what are you thinking? <laughs> that's a hard job you've just, just accepted. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And certainly Mary's a, uh, a very, very tough act to follow. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, but to me, that's one of the exciting uh, parts about it. it. It's exciting because I see the opportunity for connections between these places. Um, we have so many great things happening in our schools um, that I think one of the challenges is uh, the the connective tissue, if you will, that exists or, or could exist between those schools. And we do, um, uh, we do is a good bit of that connecting now. And for me, that's a, an exciting part of the job to sort of follow in Mary's footsteps in making those connections in helping the schools to celebrate their successes, but not only for sort of outwardly for those who are not within the schools, but also with each other, uh, because I think we all have a lot to learn from each other. And that I think is um, really exciting about this. So Mike, I, each one of us comes with our own grace and a person is only successful as the ability to create a team around them. We talked about Mary Beth and our chance encounter when my chance encounter with Bill was when he came to the diocese for an interview. And, and at that point, I, I saw the leadership potential in Bill and, and went back to Bishop Galante and said, Bishop, I, I think that we have the right person. And, you know, without, without steering any bishop's direction, I said, you know, we, we need to be always thinking about succession planning. And so Bill seemed to me to be that right person six years ago. Each one of us has our own graces, and each each one of us on our team in the Office of Catholic Schools brings a different skill set and a different grace to the position. My graces are not exactly Bill's. Bill's graces are not mine. So Bill will, will certainly has the leadership potential to create the, the next team for the Diocese of Camden Catholic Schools. You know... It- Listening to the, both of you talk, it occurs to me that even though we've had people from the schools department on before, and we've certainly had a ton of teachers and educators on over the past 125 episodes, um, I don't know if we've ever actually defined what the Office of Schools does, because it is sort of an unusual situation. I think if you're used to public schools and what a school district is, this ain't it. So, Mary, what is what does the Office of Schools do? <laughs> I know it's a loaded question. Yeah, that is a rather loaded question, Mike. Um, I, th- I think our primary focus is to be a liaison. We are the bishop's delegate for our schools. It's to be a liaison with the, with the office of the bishop. The bishop is the chief teacher of the diocese, and some of that responsibility and authority flows from him through the office of Catholic schools to our pastors and our principals. We, we really do... We are not a district. We are very different than a public school district, but we, we scaffold some supports for our schools that are akin to how a public school district would support the personnel in the schools. So, you know, we, 
we, we support them when there's con questions about students, whether that's learning questions, whether that's um, emotional questions. We support our teachers and our principals in, in their responsibilities as teachers. Um, how have you and Bill, Mary and Bill, worked together to kind of structure your transition? I mean, you're, you're both still here through the summer, which is great for those of us in the school's office. And I'm curious as to kind of how you put your heads together to say, where do we take this? Yeah, well, it's great for me, too. I'll tell you that for sure. Um, I uh, am uh, learning from Mary now with a little greater sense of urgency than I, <laughs> than I have all along. And I have been learning from Mary all along. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, I, uh, that uh, uh, we know is important is for that sense of continuity and that sense of transition. So... Um, now having uh, three months for, I would say, uh, kind of a, gr a gradual transition of uh, responsibilities um, sort of allows uh, Mary to, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, to sort of uh, kind of uh, keep the momentum that she currently has and wind things down in a kind of natural way, kind of extract herself from things and slowly hand them over uh, to me. Um, and allows me to uh, make that transition from uh, my current roles and sort of scaffolding up to uh, the responsibilities of superintendent. And, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, uh, very grateful to now uh, be, um, you know, very intentionally uh, ask, interacting with Mary around specific questions and specific um, responsibilities and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so, for example, we collaborated uh, recently on the development of uh, what the position is that we'll, we'll hire for uh, the Office of Catholic Schools. So this gets back to Mike's question about, you know, what does the Office of Catholic Schools do? Uh, and so when you, um, we're very fortunate that we'll be sort of down a staff member, and, uh, but in a, in a sense that being, uh, that trickles down, right? So that we're not down a superintendent, so we have a, a superintendent, but we are, we, some of that, some of the support that we collectively offer um, is won't if we don't have another person to do it won't won't be done. So we've been uh, we've just uh, advertised a position for an assu assistant superintendent uh, that is um, sort of out on the street now. Uh, and so Mary and I collaborated very closely. And to Mary's point, we talked about you know what are the graces and the gifts that uh, she has brought, and what am I bringing to the table, um, and where. Uh, how best do we complement those in looking for someone uh, to join our team? And uh, Mary's been, you know, very, uh, her insights and her wisdom in, in developing that have been uh, critical to really defining that. But that's one way where we've sort of thought together about, uh, based on our uh, sort of a vision for the future and the wisdom of where we are and where we've been, um, what, that, what that position looks like and who, uh, who might fill it. So if I need to take a day off this summer, who do I ask? <laughs> I would say I would say ask Mary. I mean, for my for my for my Mary's. <laughs> yeah, always ask Mary first. Now, we uh, uh, Mary's official last day here with the diocese is uh, August thirty first, and I I've told Mary I've said you know uh, you're the superintendent of schools until um, until you don't want to be anymore, and knowing Mary, that's. Uh, August 31st at 1159, but also knowing Mary um, and her her uh, gifts as a teacher and a mentor, um, I, th I think that the time when um, that will become, it, I think when you want to have a day off and you want to know who to ask, I think because of uh, Mary's skill in navigating those waters, she, you'll know. I think you'll know. I really uh, was just kidding. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've already submitted all my vacation plans yeah. for the summer, so I should be good. But yeah. no, um, and I, and I, but I use that as a you know I know that you know that's a um, indicative of you know sort of where where do you draw the where where's the um, the boundary now you know and and I think again to Mary's credit she's been very um, welcoming of inviting me into the whole you know into the entire role uh, which has been fantastic. Uh, having seen our principals at our last principals meeting, I know that this has come. You know, they were, I think everybody was really surprised at Mary's announcement um, and a little scared, like, what What do we do without Mary? And then when it was announced, Bill, that you are coming in, there's just a great sense of continuity and flow, and the principals seem really, really happy about that. So, so Mary, 
What are you going to miss the most? I will miss the the daily interaction with all the wonderful people, both working within the Diocese of Camden departments, as well as the people that make up the Church of South Jersey, the daily interactions with them. As you alluded to earlier, I live across the river, although I think I spend 20 of the 24 hours in any given day generally on this side of the river. So I hope that the relationships that I have forged will continue and be friendships um, for throughout the rest of my time, but I will miss that, that daily interaction. So. And what kind of plans do you have? What are you looking forward to doing that maybe you haven't been able to get to? I here? am really looking right now f- forward to not having things scheduled, if that makes any sense, mm-hmm. or having a little bit more control over scheduling what I want to schedule. Um, I do have a mother who is up, up in years. She'll be 92 in August. So I want to be able to be more available to her. Um, but I do want to have some fun times built in. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, we have Donegal Roots. I've reconnected with my Donegal Association and, and would like to, to spend some chunk of time in Ireland, but I don't have any specific plans on that right now. Well, as a, as a Philadelphian, uh, usually, as I'm told, when people from Philadelphia retire, they all just move to the Jersey Shore. So how soon until we see you in Sea Isle or Ocean City or Avalon or Stone Harbor? That's the real question. Well, that would be a dream, Mike. <laughs> uh, for me too, Mary. Well, I think for me too. Two Phillies games, right? There's probably a good bunch of them on tap, I imagine now. Yes. Yes. I enjoy the Phillies games, Mike. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, I'm one of these ones that... <laughs> Like to listen to the Phillies on the radio. That's you're always in the car. But you're talking about <laughs> Phillies games, Mike. You know, my my mother was born in North Philadelphia, close to Scheib Park. Oh wow! And I'm old enough to remember people watching the Phillies games from the roofs before oh. they built the spite fences. So, Mary, oh my which, gosh. so then you would be the perfect judge. Which of us was correct? Our our our, our is it the Pete, uh, Christian, always hopeful, or mine, ca- can't, just waiting for the bottom to fall out. Which is the true <laughs> Philadelphian fan? I, th- I think I me. would side with Pete. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, we did. Well, I remember, Mary, that, that was great. My dad and I went to a game with you. Yes, and We sat yes. in the Diamond Club, and that was, did. that was wonderful. Ooh, fancy, was fancy. Experience. Mm-hmm. Fancy Diamond Club. Yeah, tickets, huh? Mary invited wow. us. That was very, very, <laughs> very nice, nice of her. Right. It was uh, so. Uh, do you have predictions on this summer? How do you think the Phillies are going to do, Pete? I think one of the things I'm going to do in retirement is be able to do some of that speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I take it game by game right now. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I agree with you. My life has gotten, you know, as as all of us as we go through adulthood, it gets busier and busier and busier. And I actually miss. I I really do. I miss being able to just like fixate on the Phillies for an entire season. Like every, at the beginning of every year. Okay. I still do that with the Eagles. I will fixate that, but that's the benefit of 16 games versus 162 games. But I do occasionally miss that, that I don't have the opportunity to like, you know, I listen to WIP anymore. And you know, it's, I, I want that. But you know, listening to the games on the radio allows you to do that. I mean, and I, so that's something, um, you know, I, I'd rather listen to a game than, than watch it on TV. Uh, and I'd rather be at the game, uh, than, than anything. But, um, my my, I have two, uh, five kids. The oldest two are uh, ten years old and eight years old. They have bunk beds, and so I, when I put them to bed at night, we'll listen to the baseball game, you know. And I just love that because it's time with them, uh, but it also um, is time to just sort of get into the game, you know. There's a cadence to the banter, but you know, and you, there is that hope that the next guy, you know, like, and there's just something about hearing it. And I remember that from my childhood. My mom always had the game on in the kitchen after dinner. I think she still does um and so we um we sort of it allows it's interesting that sort of as an is as a little bit of, of an escape you know and and i'm really uh happy to be able to do that with the boys and sort of so they're speculating about everything right and they're living and dying with every game you know i mean um I, I think, and, and my son, one of my sons, and I will, uh, you know, to protect him, not tell you which one, takes every uh, every Phillies loss, you know, however many there are. I mean, even down to every 
strike out with a guy on third and two outs very, very deeply, you know. So um, I'm sort of living that again th- through him, and that's a, that's a, great, um, that's a great pastime and in many ways a great escape. Bill, you'll probably appreciate that my dog is named for Harry Callis. <laughs> so. Absolutely. <laughs> His name is Harry Callis? Well, it's a she, and we got her right after Harry Callis died, and so we called her Harry Callis, but we call her Callie. That so. is awesome. I think that's the best dog name I've ever heard. Callie, it's like Sally with a K. Nobody knows how to spell it, but it's Sally with a K. But you know, one of the things, and this just sort of reminds me about Harry Callis, and and you know, if you when you go to the Phillies game now, you know he's I, he's been, I don't know what over ten years, you know that um, yeah. that uh, since he died, he's present in the Phillies games. You know, they hit a home run and they just say play that little clip out of here, you know. But that's it, you know. But he's very present there. But his, but the the current announcers are not. Um, I think offended by that. It's not personal. He's a part of the fabric of the um, of the of the team, and I think that I think that's I think that's pretty neat how they, that he's able to continue to be a fabric of the uh, of the team, and uh, even even now. All right. Well, as we uh, as we wrap up, uh, Pete, any any last thoughts while we have these two here? Yeah, we, just, we don't uh, often get two superintendents in the vault. This is nice. Well, I'd like to know if it's on tap. I mean, one of the questions I ask is uh, early in the early years of this early episodes, right? I guess we can we call it the early years. I guess we're still in the early this years. Is year, this is year three, so sure. Yeah. Early so years. I mean, well, the earlier earlier years, I kept on asking questions. You know, what are you reading? And Mary, and and this for Bill. Uh, do, are you going to have time now for summer reading? I am going to have time for summer reading. Well, maybe maybe autumn reading since I'm officially not finished until August 31st. So I'm looking forward to crawling up with a blanket and a book. Any Did book? You, what genre would you? I like a good novel for just lightening up a little bit. Mm-hmm. How about you, Bill? Any reading ahead with... Five kids buzzing around your ears yeah, at all well, times. Uh, right now, I'm reading, reading a lot of books on school law and education <laughs> policy. Uh, so that's taken up good. <laughs> they're re- they're very interesting and gripping. Um, and I'm only I'm not really even being sarcastic. I guess it takes a certain kind of person to appreciate that stuff. Um, you know, I I'm one of these people who I'll have a book and it will take me a long time to read it because of the professional reading that I do and the, um, yeah, having five kids and running the baseball games and swim practices and just trying to have dinner and put you know dinner laundry and a bath will tire you out uh, almost every night. But there's one that I just got. It's called the Library Book, uh, and it is about libraries and how they operate and how they work. But it's really it's focused the the thread that the author uses is about the um, uh, Los Angeles uh, Library fire in uh, I believe it was 1989, um, and 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 it's just very skillful the way that she uses that to sort of dig into what libraries are and their history and how they uh, how they operate. Um, and so that's so when I have a when I have a couple of minutes I'll pick that up and read a few pages and pick up the thread. I'm going to go out on a limb and say you should write the blurb for the dust jacket of that book because I'm pretty sure no one has said anything about a library book about <laughs> libraries that is sounds that engaging. Yeah. <laughs> so well done, yeah. sir. Uh, I'm, I'm actually half tempted to read it. I won't, but I'm half-tempted. no. It is a very good book. I got halfway through it and then I had to return it to the library. <laughs> I was one of those. I should have yeah, renewed it. A, I'm sorry. I, I, the, the sad part is that sounds like a joke and i know you you mean it right no yeah. because, well I, I i'm one of these I, I hate it i pick up a book i put it down pick it up put it down and i did get it and it's a great book i really enjoyed it but it was during a busy time and i just i wasn't you know i'm kidding myself i won't have time to read this so i i'm ashamed i now now i need to go back to the library and pick it up Phil. but but i <laughs> but and i guess one of the ironies is that i purchased the library book Right, so you can you can purchase the library book, you know. That's very uh, so. I thought. Well, was... don't make an easy on them. Don't give it to them when you're done. Make yeah. them go out and go back to the library and write it again. <laughs> okay. That should be my penance. All right. How about you? Any last comments from you, Mary Beth? Yes, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank Mary for all that you have taught me in the last three years. It's been really incredible, and I I never would have imagined it. You're a wonderful mentor, and we will miss you. And Bill, we're happy that you're staying and and 
moving into that role. So, um, you know, on behalf of the Office of Catholic Schools, we feel incredibly lucky. And the Diocese of Camden is even luckier. And I'm going to just deal with you people for years on end and you for at least another four months. I'm not going to say anything nice going out, but, uh, you know, let's <laughs> hope nothing goes insane this summer <laughs> for the rest of the school year, at least. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, thank you, too, for coming on and joining us in the vault. And Mary Beth, as always, thank you for pitching in as our co-host. And Pete, thanks for setting this all up. And all of our listeners, thanks for listening in. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Bye. <laughs>